Good evening, everybody. Tom Kowalski speaking from the Sausalito Yacht Club. This is a continuation of our um, uh, speaker series. Um, as we know, we continue to be virtual via Zoom, and the plans are that we will continue to do so um, uh, per the Marin County guidelines for the COVID-19, et cetera. Uh, I want to give you a brief background how as I first was introduced to this book, it was essentially through our local bookstore in Sausalito, Sausalito Books by the Bay. I visit there often, and there was this book on the shelf. I discussed it briefly with Jeff, uh, the manager, and he highly recommended it, and I picked it up, read it, and I'm rereading it. So it's a fascinating book, and I just briefly want to introduce Melissa Darby. Um, she has multiple degrees, um, is an anthropologist, a visiting scholar, uh, for the uh, Portland State uh, University in Anthropology um, and has uh, written this book regarding uh, continued investigations of the voyages of um, Sir Francis Drake. And as you, many of you know at the Yacht Club, we have a model of the Golden Hind in our display case. And on our far wall at the galley is a uh, large panoramic photograph of the uh, Golden Hind replica entering the Golden Gate Bridge, I believe in 1973. So kindly welcome to Saucer Yacht Club, uh, author Melissa Darby. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Ahoy. <laughs> I'm really glad to be here. Um, I might change a paradigm or two tonight. I, I hope so, but uh, I really appreciate you listening. So. Without any further ado, let's, uh, let's begin. The title of my talk tonight and the, the title of my book is Thunder Go North, The Hunt for Sir Francis Drake's Fair and Good Bay. Francis Drake was not yet Sir Francis when he circumnavigated the globe on what was to become the famous voyage. This was the second circumnavigation of the globe after Magellan. And during this voyage in the summer of 1579, Drake with his crew of 80 men and one uh, black woman camped and repaired their ships at a bay they called a fair and good bay somewhere on the west coast of America. And I postulate that this was in Oregon. Uh, the theory that they spent the summer on the Oregon coast is at present unimaginable and uncritical acceptance of the dominant theory of a California landing is, you know, understandably the norm. But today I'm gonna to go over the reasons why people have been misled about Drake's movements on the coast and the geographical location of his fair and good bay. Reason one, this was a secret mission. The plan of Drake's voyage was a closely guarded secret the crew thought they were going, going to Alexandria to load a cargo of currents. And it was only after they set sail that uh, they were uh, informed that they were gonna go to the Great South Sea or the Pacific Ocean where no English ship had voyaged before. British historian and geographer Eva Taylor by chance found the manuscript with the plans of the voyage only in 1929. This manuscript had been overlooked, its edges are burnt, but it still retains most of the instructions for the voyage, which called for Drake to look for trade commodities such as spice, drugs, scarlet dye. He, um, he was also instructed to find lands that weren't in the possession of any Christian prince, and uh, it, though it's not in this paper, he was also instructed to look for the Northwest Passage, some evidence pretty compelling that he, that's what he was trying to do as well. With regards to the scarlet dye, I want you to keep that in mind for the moment. This color, the color red, was reserved for royal classes and the clothing of the Elizabethans. Um, uh, they liked uh, red thread. Um, anyway, it's no small point that the voyage was conducted with Queen Elizabeth's support and it was a covert operation under the guise of piracy. So I'm going to briefly go over the voyage in case you know you don't know about it. I, I, I'm assuming that your audience is pretty well informed on this, but 
here we, here we go. They began their voyage on December 13th, 1577, when Francis Drake and his fleet of five ships left Plymouth. The crew consisted of about 164 able men who were men at arms and sailors. The fleet carried cooks, a surgeon, smiths. They had a forge on the Golden Hind. There were carpenters and coopers. Um, there were musicians, a trumpeter and uh, a drummer and at least uh, two violists. Um, Drake's brother and one of his cousins were officers and his cabin boy was his young cousin, John Drake. And Diego, a slave that he had freed on a previous voyage um, uh, from Panama, sailed as Drake's manservant or his assistant and a paid member of the crew. Officers included a chaplain, Chaplain Fletcher, and various gentlemen and noblemen who were investors or who were supported by their patrons at court. Um, so by mid-August, they had arrived in South America. They scuttled two of their slower ships and they reached their first important uh, objective, which was the Strait of Magellan. Taken from east to west, the strait is exceptionally perilous in contrary winds. And I know I'm talking to sailors, so you know this. And the winds are typically contrary down there. As soon as they left the strait and got into the Pacific Ocean, a relentless gale drove them south to 200 leagues. Um, the wind was continuous for much of the time the ship the ships could not bear any sail. There was, uh, they were on short rations and worn out by working in this bitter cold um, where these monstrous waves battered them for 52 days straight. Um, one of the ships sunk uh, in the stormy seas and another ship, when they got, when they finally started working their way north, another ship uh, hightailed it back to England. Um, and so only the Golden Hind at this point remained. Uh, the crew uh, now was about only 85 men. They proceeded north seeking food and fresh water and to kind of get, get back into uh, some good health. They had uh, scurvy problems right there. Um, they stopped at Mocha Island, that's right there. And uh, they were attacked by the natives. Drake got an arrow in his uh, cheek right by his nose. Diego got multiple arrows, but they were small and they didn't penetrate very well. But he did probably die of these wounds many months later. Um, anyway, so they made their way up the western coast of South America, surprising the Spanish. They were capturing unarmed Spanish vessels who had no idea that uh, the Lutherans or the Drake was in their waters. Um, they, Drake plundered some colonial ports and they amassed a huge amount of treasure. Their, their biggest prize was the Panama bound treasure ship loaded with jewels, pearls, 40 pounds of gold, chest full of coins, 26 tons of silver. There was so much silver, they ballasted the gold and hind. So on, on March 17th, Drake and his men captured a small Spanish merchant ship. And they kept that vessel, um, Tello's bark. There's some disagreement about this, but I think it was Tello's bark. And uh, they kept it for the whole Western part of, of the coast. Um, on April 4th, they captured a merchant uh, ship that had a cargo of cloth and expensive clothes and some Chinese porcelain ceramics. Drake freed a young black woman named Maria she was either pregnant when he, capt when, when he captured the ship or she got pregnant soon after. Uh, we're not sure, we'll probably never know. Um, uh, Drake's last port of call was at Wiltapo yeah. on April 15th. And here he looted the town. And uh, there were three men on trial for um, trying to burn the town down. These were black men and two of, two of these uh, joined Drake's crew, he freed them. So um, they sailed out into the Pacific to catch the trade wind. And by June, Drake had sighted what is now the United States or Canada. They'd been looking for the Northwest Passage, but they were taking on water. They, were, they, they had encountered a summer storm. 
They had this leak since they were off the coast of Panama and it, they really needed a port to, to careen the ship over on some soft sand in a bay that was protected from breakers. And, and they were desperate. And if you know the, um, the waters along the Washington and Oregon coast, they're pretty rough. There's a lot of basalt outcrops where seals pull out and um, anyway, so, but they did find a place. I, at, at 45 degrees uh, north, or 44 degrees north in their Fair and Good Bay. And um, they uh, stayed for either five or 10 weeks. I think it was 10 weeks. The accounts are inconsistent about these things because there was a lot of um, fudging of the accounts and there was Spanish spies and it was a secret mission. So there was misinformation put out. Um, Drake and his officers explored the country and they wrote down uh, descriptions of the animals and plants that they found there. So finally in August they set sail across the Pacific. They, they had repaired the ship. They probably left Tello's bark uh, on the west coast. When they got to the Spice Islands, Drake negotiated a tra trade agreement for a uh, clove trade. In what's now Indonesia, they found an island paradise they called Crab Island, which uh, they said reflect, refreshed their wearied bodies. Here they left the heavily pregnant Maria and her black companions with a supply of rice, seeds, and a way of making uh, um, fire so they could start a settlement. They stopped in Java for provisions, replenished their rice store, and in the Indian Ocean, they almost perished. Uh, um, uh, off of Mozambique for want of water. And they saw elephants when they rounded the Cape of Good Hope and stopped at Guinea. At the end of September um, in 1580, they finally returned to their home port of Plymouth. Uh, almost immediately, Elizabeth confiscated the records of the voyage and the crew was made to swear an oath uh, that not to reveal where they had traveled on pain of death. So let's look at reason two, while there, why there is so much confusion and controversy where Drake landed his little ship. Reason two, it was an illegal land grab. The latitudes reported in Hecklett's official account say that he sighted land around 42, went down to 38, and careened his vessel there. But what actually happened is Drake completely bypassed California, went up to 48 degrees, needed a careenage, stopped, stopped at 44, you know, there's, there was his fair and good bay. The official account was designed not only to claim more land than England was entitled to, by the rules of the time, but it was a check to Spanish expansion. This is the northern limit of New Spain. When they looked at the maps and they got back, I think they said, hey, this is a gap. We, we don't want any gap on the coast. Let's just say that you went down to 38, okay? <laughs> so that's probably what happened. Um, and it was a land grab. So, it, so um, it would have been difficult for Drake and his square shell, sailed ship to sail close to the coast at that time of year. Um, and he said he went out 800 leagues to the west to get a good wind. And so I think this would put him up to 44 degrees north for his careenage and maybe off the coast of Vancouver Island and then sailing south with the wind and the currents. And you're all sailors, so I think you know what I'm talking about here. Um, so here, this is a famous depiction from the Handias broadside of Drake's uh, Portus Nova Albion. Um, this is a depiction of their fair and good bay. It may have been copied from Drake's uh, original um, uh, charts that are now lost. It shows a cape to the south, a mountainous area to the southeast, a long peninsula on the coast. Um, and an island off here. It shows the natives burning sacrifices here, here, and here. This might be Tello's bark, and this might be the crew of Tello's bark that Drake left behind. 
Uh, up here is Drake's Fort, where he's, they spent the time while they were careening the ship. Um, uh, the crew uh, in the Golden Hind, when they got back, numbered about 60, so 20 men are unaccounted for. And John Drake, uh, the Drake's cousin, nephew, said that uh, they left these men in the Americas or in the Californians, Californias. So that's the West Coast. They use that term loosely. Um, it's possible that Drake's Fair Bay is Whale Cove on the Oregon coast. This is just south of Depot Bay. Um, this idea was first proposed in the 1950s by um, the captain of the trade winds, uh, which was uh, Captain Stan Allen. He would take tourists in there and say, maybe this is where Drake sailed. Um, in the 1970s, a, a British man named Bob Ward popularized this idea in the 1970s. And um, he's been banging the drum for Whale Cove ever since. The shape of the cove is a good match, as is the geography. There's a mountainous bay, uh, um, uh, a basalt peninsula. Uh, it looks pretty close, except there's no island off, off of the peninsula. But if you look at the LIDAR, there, uh, there is a, a shoal, and 400 years ago, this might have been an island. So uh, it looks pretty good. I, uh, I, I'm, some days I'm completely convinced. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So now let's look at reason three, why people have been misled into thinking Drake was in California. This is Zelia Nuttall. In the early 20th century, new clues to Drake's movements in the Pacific came to light with her findings. She was an anthropologist and archaeologist working in Mexico, and she found a trove of contemporary documents about Drake and his depredations in New Spain. These were depositions and letters from captains of ships that he captured and mayors of the towns that Drake looted. And she continued her research in Europe, and she found quite a few old maps and she came to the conclusion that Drake was on the northwest coast. Um, she was from San Francisco. She was born there but she was educated in Europe and she knew how hard it would be to change people, uh, change people's minds. So reason three why we uh, are confused about where Drake landed is um, uh, California historians, particularly one of them named Herbert Bolton, um, launched a subterfuge to shut down Nettle and her theory that Drake was on the Northwest Coast. She found evidence, um, ethnographic evidence in Drake's descriptions. For example, uh, Drake described plank houses and canoes, and the Miwok have grass houses and reed boats. Um, she thought that was pretty interesting. And so, you know, but she never was allowed to publish her work. She was shut down and no editorial board would, would, uh, would touch her work. Um, but in 1915, she presented her research in, uh, about Drake on the Pacific in the big history conference organized by Herbert Bolton. Her paper was met with coldness. Um, this was at the Panama Pacific exhibition in San Francisco. And um, uh, she was never, uh, never taken seriously. Um, not all theory on the northern limits of Drake in the Pacific was not published. And at this same moment in California history, Drake's swashbuckling legend was being polished by an organization that you might all know, the Native Sons of the Golden West. Uh, once a year, they fly Drake, Drake's flag or the stand, or Queen Elizabeth's standard to celebrate Drake. And um, they were the sponsor of Herbert Bolton at Berkeley, and they provided scholarships to Herbert Bolton's students. So it just wouldn't do for Drake not to be in California. Um, he was their swashbuckling hero, and um, you know he was the golden son of the Golden State. Um, as I mentioned above, historian and ethnographer Eva Taylor in the 20s and in the 30s found documents and maps that supported Nuttall's theory. 
Um, and she started publishing, she published a book and various articles. And um, uh, she found that uh, one person who was a linguistic expert told her that one of the words, or one or more of the words that Drake recorded appear to be a, from a Chinookan language. Well, the Chinookans are not on the California coast. And just after she found that, uh, just as Taylor's work was changing minds in the Northwest Coast theory was taking off and getting traction, it was dramatically eclipsed by the plate of brass, made, the alleged plate made by Drake to mark his land claim. This was found on a hillside above San Francisco Bay. It was shown to Herbert Bolton, that's Herbert on the right, who declared it almost certainly an authentic artifact from Drake. He arranged for the finder uh, to receive a monetary reward of $3,500. This caught the imagination of the public. It's got to be real if they're offering that amount of money to them. Um, uh, it, it didn't, this plate put Bolton in the limelight. It made him even more famous than he was. And I found that uh, he was actually a serial hoaxer. I found other hoaxes that he did, but the plate of brass was his brainchild to shut down the discussion that Drake was further north as proposed by Nuttall and Taylor. The man who authenticated the plate of brass <laughs> was the one who created it. And I know there's people maybe listening now who have more information about Bolton and this. And uh, if you do, please let me know because I'm trying to write another article that uh, uh, expands on this. Anyway, Bolton, uh, he was also, I found, a white supremacist on a mission to exalt the white race. His doctoral uh, dissertation was about, the, was titled Free Negro in the South, and in it he called Blacks idol and descendants of heathens, and um, he didn't think that blacks should be able to testify in court. The Christmas was, you know, this was in the time when Jim Crow was a big deal. And um, anyway, a lot of people had these kind of beliefs back then. This was, uh, I think, around the turn of the turn of the century. Um, but when he got the plate, he touted the plate as authentic because it called attention to the golden knight, the white golden knight that really put home to everybody that we were, America was founded by the British, the English. Um, he was one of the most famous and most awarded historians in the United States. He had two knighthoods, one from Spain and one from Italy. Um, he was uh, awarded a, 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 some sort of award from the Pope. Uh, he was an officer in the American Historical Association, including president in 1932, president of the whole United States Historical Association. Um, he taught at Berkeley, and uh, he was the director of the Bancroft Library. And according to um, his biographer, he turned out 104 doctoral students and 323 master's degree students. He had an incredible uh, um, uh, uh, legacy there. His students taught at the university level and the, many became high school history teachers. His influence was systemic and he's one of the reasons why black history is not taught in Native Americans. Uh, the genocide of Native Americans is not taught. Uh, he had a lot of influence over history books for a long time into the 50s. Uh, many of Bolton's colleagues, however, disliked him. His detractors thought of him as a huckster, and he courted publicity. He had the phone numbers to all the press, and he would call them up. And, you know, I examined Bolton's papers and correspondence at the Bancroft Library, um, where he was director from 1920 to 1940. The plate wasn't Bolton's only hoax. There was a couple of... Um, Spanish treasure maps, the, the last will and testament of a Spanish explorer, all these were, were phony, but he touted them as real. Uh, it's the plate that really took off. 
Um, he also had a, a scheme about pirate treasure. Anyway, that all that's in my book, and you don't need to go into that stuff. He also had a hand in this. This is the famous Chowan River Dare Stone, which now can be also declared a hoax. Um, this was the, a cobble purportedly inscribed in 1591 with a message from one of the Roanoke colonists, Eleanor Dare. The message was to her father telling him of the fate of the Roanoke colonists, that they moved inland and so forth. Anyway, Bolton had a hand in this. So <clears throat> back to this. Between 1937 in 1977, the Drake Plate of Brass was considered authentic, but the academics couldn't agree to the exact location of Drake's, Drake's anchorage. It was a huge discussion. This has been California's most prolonged historical discussion, and there's been um, a lot of controversy because there's no real good fair bay or safe harbor that's suitable within a degree or two of 38 or Drake's Bay, somewhere, Bolinas Bay, San Quentin Cove. Um, and since the 1970s, um, historians have kind of backed off of it and it's become, for the most part, a tug of war among non-academics who are, you know, have booster clubs and they assert <clears throat> that their favored bay is the one and it, it just went on and on. <clears throat> So now the, the fourth reason why people have been misled into thinking that Drake was in California is the recent landmark status, national landmark status awarded to Drake's Bay. Now remember a Spanish ship was wrecked there in 1895 after Drake was wherever he was and the cargo included crates of Chinese porcelain artifacts and so did Drake's cargo. Um, the, the group that wrote the National Landmark nomination um, uh, tried to use the Chinese ceramics as support for their nomination, but the National Park Service archaeologists said, wait a minute, none of these porcelains were from Drake's ship. We can't parse that down that carefully. So um, we believe that all these artifacts are actually from the later Spanish wreck. So um, the National Park Service, after many edits and changes and back and forth with the group, agreed to an awkwardly worded statement about the landing, stressing the importance of the Spanish shipwreck and just that Drake may, be, may have been there, maybe, maybe not. Oh, but those qualifying words upset the Drake's Bay group and they not only chose to ignore them, when, when the national landmark status was announced, they announced to the news and media that it, uh, Drake's Bay was now officially the place where Drake landed, and that was not a, that was an untruth. They said that it gave formal recognition to Francis Drake's landing site at Drake's Cove in 1579. Uh, it did not. Um, uh, this was an untruth, and it's the fourth reason why people have been misled into thinking that Drake was in California. And it should be noted that national landmark nominations can be easily amended. And this one was just uh, sent in not too long ago and it will be in the permanent record. So now we know the reasons why people have believed for so long that Drake was on the California coast. So let's turn to some of the evidence of Drake's presence on the Northwest coast. There's only scant archeological evidence of Europeans from that date. There's, um, uh, there was a chisel found in a Native American house floor dating from around 1600 near Yahats on the Oregon coast. An English silver shilling um, that dated from 1560 was reportedly found on a beach after the Columbus Day storm. Um, but the most compelling evidence is the cultural evidence and as a anthropologist and archaeologist, this is what I was looking at, in support of Zelia et al.'s hypothesis that uh, Drake's descriptions of semi-underground plank houses uh, describe the people of the Northwest Coast. I, I agree with that. And um, this is a Tolawa men's house. It's a, um, 
it's a it's a sweat house, but they also slept in their sweat houses on the southern Oregon, central and southern Oregon coast. Further north, they did not uh, have this kind of sweat house sleeping arrangement. Men and women and families slept in the, the larger um, house where everybody cooked. But on this particular part of the central and southern Oregon coast, uh, houses were really deep underground um, and they were covered with dirt just like Drake described. And they were like the scuttle of a ship. And this is a, a better description um, than, uh, than the Miwok houses, though, though there are some Miwok sweat houses that were semi-subterranean. Drake was describing their dwellings, not uh, anything special. They were, he said they lived in these houses. So this is a much better description, the most compelling one. Um, Fletcher wrote that the houses are digged around within the earth and have uh, uh, from them circle of clefts of wood set up and joined close together at the top like our spires on the steeple. Now if you google wooden steeple in early modern England or medieval times, you find wooden steeples that look like this. And so I think that this was what what uh, Chaplain Fletcher was looking at that he thought that that looked sort of like a steeple or the um, the roof was joined like the steeple. Anyway, so that's um, that's that. Okay, so here here we have an image of Drake being crowned with a feather crown by the Native Americans, um, and he, Drake thought this meant that they were making him the leader. But on the central and southern Oregon coast, it's common to, to um, as gifts to give, and even now the native people do this, they give people headdresses as gifts. Um, uh, Drake was also very interested in this fur cloak that the people were wearing. Um, and the native leader and the king wore this fur cloak. And Drake called it uh, the animal that this came from a coney. And he said, it looks like the Barbary Coney, but it has a long bald tail and hands like a mole. And, um, and he wanted to know about this fur. Well, um, as the ship was being prepared, Drake went out uh, with some of the gentlemen and they went out and he saw multitudes of these conies and described them. And um, uh, he reported that, that uh, they also carry their, their food in their cheeks. So what, what was this coney? What was this animal? Um, this right here is the Cape Hyrax, which is the Barbary coney that Drake was talking about. The, the, all the sailors that sailed in, around uh, North Africa and the African coast were familiar with this Barbary coney. Um, uh, and, uh, but there's no animal like this on the California coast. So uh, some of the California theorists think that it was the pocket gopher. Of course, we have pocket gopher up here in Oregon as well, but I think a better uh, uh, match for this fur-bearing animal that Drake was so interested in is the muskrat because it has a long bald tail, has hands like a mole, it carries its food in its cheeks, and it has a beautiful pelt that the Native Americans um, used. And because in, this, in our wet environment up here, this pelt was warm and waterproof, which was the perfect thing. In fact, Lewis and Clark mentioned that the people of the coast wear this. And here's actually a painting of a woman wearing a, a, a muskrat uh, fur cloak. Um, this was painted by Paul Kane and it's a cowlitz woman. So we have a lot of good ethnographic evidence that the people were wearing muskrat fur robes and muskrat fits Drake's description. So this is a pretty, pretty darn good match. And um, I think Bob Ward was the first one to come up with this idea, though it just completely follows really well. Okay, so <clears throat> now Drake described the Native American basketry in detail down to the matted red feathers that uh, he said made designs. Now on the Oregon coast, 
the Native Americans would wrap the red feathers from the red-headed woodpecker and twist them around sinew and make this beautiful thread that they, even today, they still do this. They, uh, they put on their hats and their regalia and their baskets. In later times, they, um, the feathers were changed out by beads, but the motifs are the same. And so um, glass beads or silk thread, some of, some of the baskets on the Oregon coast have silk thread, um, but uh, these are the matted <laughs> red down feathers. Now I know the Miwok have, have feathered baskets and the, the word fully feathered has come down in times, but Drake never said fully feathered. Just look it up, he never said fully feathered. He said feather, the matted red feathers. <laughs> so, so anyway, red connotes uh, royalty. And so this is what Drake was interested in. He zeroed in on red color. He zeroed in on furs because only the royal or higher status people could wear fur. And so he was looking for trade commodities. Look, he was a merchant. So these are the things he was instructed to look for. So I don't think it, I don't think he was looking for a pocket gopher. Okay, so there are five words and two phrases that were spoken by the people that Drake encountered. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, Eva Taylor had a linguist study these and found that the people at the Farangood Bay were speaking a Chinookan language. It's possible, he said, and it seems likely they were actually speaking Chinook jargon, which is derived from Chinook, but it was a trade language. Um, uh, the word heo um, was spoken when the leader arrived. So Drake was there, an emissary came down and said, heo, heo. And Drake, being the Elizabethan, thought, oh, this means the king is coming, the king is coming. But in Chinook jargon, heo, heo means we're having a big celebration or a potlatch or a, you know, a big formal gathering, heo, heo. And so Drake misinterpreted that word, um, I believe. And um, the other thing that uh, um, might be Chinook jargon is the word peta for the root that they were given. Um, I did my master's thesis on Wapato, this root, and this is how I got hooked into this whole, this whole uh, research study, as it were. Um, Wapato is an important food for the Native Americans because it grow in, in this area because it grows in wetlands. Um, it's available all winter long, which is an important thing in in this climate. You can harvest it by wading into the water, and it floats to the top of the water and and you throw them in your basket. And it's, it tastes like a potato, cooks very fast like a potato. And it was also dried or made into cakes. It was an important trade item uh, from the people of the, of the Columbia and Willamette rivers to the people on the coast um, who had fewer wetlands because it was massive wetlands along the Columbia River. So um, one of the Chinook, jargon variants of Wapato is pota, which sounds a lot like peta, come on. And I was like, wow, this has got to be it. And the root was made into a bread that is called, it's hard for me to pronounce, but saplil, saplil, it's a Native American jargon word, which sounds a lot like how Drake might have written it as cheap as bread. So this root made bread. Anyway, so um, Justice Taylor found this word list and published her findings. The plate of brass was found, and then that ended all that speculation. And uh, so this is the two women that I think broke the case or, or really understood what, what really may have happened, both great scholars. Celia not all and Eva, Eva Taylor, though, they had trespassed on the high ground of a California myth and found a trake, take Drake out of California was akin to pulling up the redwoods. The barriers that Herbert Bolton threw up against these women defeated them at the time, but they weren't diminished by these actions. And in this new light, it's clear that Bolton and the others are the ones that are 
diminished um, by their actions. I just love her. And I love her. <laughs> so the Northwest Coast theory of Drake's Landing is still unimaginable to many scholars and the acceptance of the dominant paradigm of a California landing is still understandably the norm. Um, but we got to understand that Drake uh, was on a secret mission. The queen put out false information. Uh, a racist, Calif racist California historian wanted to keep Drake uh, as his golden hero or for California. Uh, and uh, what's been missing is in this discussion over the years is a critical analysis of this voyage and a discussion of the social and cultural importance of the voyage. There are important Native American stories that have yet to be told in a foolish way, as well as Black stories that have been downplayed over the years. I find it intriguing that events on the Oregon coast many years ago inspired Shakespeare. Um, uh, uh, the circumnavigation by Drake and later um, uh, by Cavendish was such a triumph for England that Shakespeare named the Globe Theater after, this, after these uh, accomplishments. And additionally, the narrative events at the Fair and Good Bay um, featured a native who worshiped the strange new people as gods, as seen in The Tempest, which began with a storm and a shipwreck. So that is my talk, and I'm sure you will have plenty of questions for me. But I want to know uh, if anyone knows any more information about the plate of brass or that whole plot, uh, contact me later. But I am now open and ready to answer any of your questions. Well, that was great, Melissa. Thank you very much. Very informative. And I'm going to just remind everyone to go ahead and put uh, the questions you would like to ask in chat. And uh, we'll have you unmute yourselves and ask them in order. But right now, the first few questions come from our own Commodore Tom. Uh, take it away, Tom. Well, Melissa, thank you very much. That was very informative and congratulations on your work. Um, I'm fascinated by this story and we'll probably continue to study it. A couple of questions. Uh, I understood that uh, um, Drake had a, a pilot on board that may have been called De Silva, who was Portuguese. Yes. Uh, so that that's correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, my own understanding, and we just were the Pelican in last night near Muir Beach. Was the original name of the boat the Pelican? Yes. It started out as Pelican, but um, according to Harry Kelsey, has a different view of this. He's a historian that wrote a book about Drake. Um, he thinks that the the, they renamed the Pelican uh, after the voyage, maybe, but um, one of the accounts says it was renamed as, uh, as they entered the uh, Strait of Magellan. It's not clear, but by the end of the voyage, it was called the Pelican. I mean, it was called the Golden Hind. Okay. It did, uh, it did get a name change. Um, and I, I think you've already, I, I wrote this down, I think you've already addressed the issue of the Chinese porcelain, and that really is no longer applicable to this. Um, my final question is, what happened to the ship after they landed back in Plymouth? They were sworn to secrecy. Um, was the ship sold, broken up, rotted uh, away? Well, that's, that's interesting. Well, um, Drake sailed into Plymouth Harbor and there was a plague at the time. And so he didn't, land, he didn't get off the ship, his wife and, and uh, a messenger came and they, they said to Drake, you are in the queen's bad graces on account of all the robberies you made. So um, uh, a few days later, he was allowed to go visit the queen and take some examples of his work. And she was very impressed. Of course, he had all this treasure. So he was knighted about four months later and she made the, the Golden Hind into a, uh, a monument that was a tourist attraction. And students would come and nail poems on the mast and uh, he was knighted on board, uh, on board the Golden Hind. And it was there for a long time. 
um, in London, I believe it was London, not 100% sure, but, um, and, and then it just, it, it, ships don't last, I guess I'm telling you something you already know, and then it just deteriorated. So that's, that's what happened to it, but it was a monument for a while. Right, I was aware of it being a monument, but it just, as any wooden ship would just gradually deteriorate with worms and beetles and that sort of thing. And if one other quick, quick comment, um, can you uh, dis explain the background to why it was called the Golden Hind? Uh, one of, uh, uh, Hatton was one of Drake's sponsors, Christopher Hatton, Timothy, oh gosh. Anyway, his his crest, his coat of arms, had featured the the golden hind, which was a, a female deer, um, and so Drake, to uh, 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 to honor his sponsor, renamed the ship the Golden Hind. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, just reaching out to the rest of the group. Any other questions uh, that you have? You can go ahead and unmute yourself and answer directly. Well, Tom, I think she was very Tom. thorough tonight. Okay, yes, I, we I, go. Have, I have a question. Sure. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Uh, Walton, according to you, was uh, an accomplished historian in his day. Uh, I, I, was, I wanted to ask how much of his racist views affected his historical narrative regarding Drake and exactly how do you uh, weigh Walton in? <clears throat> um. Bolton didn't write that much about Drake. He, he mostly wrote about uh, Spanish explorers and he translated documents that he and his students found in various archives. Um, uh, racists aren't typically blatant out there, especially university <laughs> professors. So he, I think he, he expressed his views mostly in private. And, um, uh, um, I don't have anything except his doctoral dissertation that, that, that really proves to me how racist he was. And he might have changed over the years and, um, and uh, you know, been, you know, as people grow older and they grow wiser, I hope that that happened to him. I'm not sure, but um, he did trump up, he did trump up Drake as a great hero and um, in his speech, at the uh, California Historical Society, after the plate was found, it, he he said things like, "If this is if this is a, a hoax, then the whoever did it was you know incredibly intelligent." And you know, there's these little things that I, when you read it with a nuanced look, you go, "Oh yeah, he did that. He did that." But I think he was just trying to block uh, Eva Taylor and Celia Nuttall and. Um, you know, Zelia et al. was also part Hispanic, and um, the president of the University of California was a strong eugenicist, and they didn't like Mexicans, and they called them mixed blood mongrels, and so um, this was the setting, this was the times. I have to say that this, this was not an unusual, this was not unusual thinking back in the 20s, 30s, 40s that um, you know, you wanna have this manifest destiny, that America is destined to be um, uh, settled by whites and, and that was what God endowed for us, we are superior or whatever, you know, this, is, this was kind of normal thinking. Um, and no matter how much we think it's wrong now, and as an anthropologist, I, it's very wrong. <laughs> so, um, and Bolton was, he did some great work, you know, people are complex. I mean, he did some great work. He's, he's been attacked um, lately because of some of his, you know, really narrow thinking about uh, the frontier, but the, he was a man of his times. And um, 
Uh, I hope I hope that answered your question. Next, <laughs> Melissa. This is, Melissa, this is Kevin Friel. I had a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I had a question. I thought that Drake referenced like the shoreline as reminding him of the White Cliffs of Dover. Yes. If you sail up to Drake's Bay, you really get the impression of the, you know, the White Cliffs and stuff. Does does this Oregon site have the same thing or? Well, there's Cape Blanco, which is the farthest uh, uh, west point on the coast, and it's pretty wide. They call it Cape Blanco. But we do have, we do have um, sandstone cliffs, and we have basalt cliffs. So um, I, I think it fits the bill. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, eliminate it for sure. But I, I, I will say that the cliffs in California are wider. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just wondered. I have two questions. Yes, I can hear Go you. Ahead. Uh, the, the latest issue of The Scope uh, has an article referring to uh, Drake as a notorious slave trader. I wonder if that's true or where it comes from. And, and uh, uh, the other question is, why was his voyage around the world a, a secret one? Uh, okay, first I'll address the slave issue. Uh, Drake was a slaver. He, he was working for his uncle on two slaving voyages when he was in his 20s. We don't know if he was an officer, but um, he, he, was, he probably was. Um, but how much agency he had in that whole thing is, is, is not clear. And um, after that, they stopped doing any slave voyages at all because it was such a disaster, the um, San Juan de Ula, where they lost a lot of men. And Drake sailed back home and told his uncle that his other uncle was dead. And then three or four days later, uh, uh, Hawkins came in and said, you know, Drake, you forsook us. You, you left us. And um, that really impacted a young Drake. And for after that, he wanted to get revenge. And um, the other thing about slaves is uh, he, uh, in, in those times, if you, if you were a slave and you set foot on an English ship, it meant you were free. And so oh. they'd go down there and they would like, come up to the shore, let me on, I have something important to tell you. And then all of a sudden you were free. And so um, that's how Diego got free as he, he gave him some inside information and then he sailed with Drake. So I think it's the nuanced thing. There was, this was the times and even Queen Elizabeth sponsored Hawkins voyage to the Guinea coast to collect slaves. But um, I, I think in this atmosphere um, of taking down statues and stuff that uh, we just got to let that happen and things will settle down and people will really <laughs> take a look at, at Drake. And um, I'm currently looking for Maria. Um, I'm, I'm trying to work with uh, the University of Indonesia, the anthropologist there, to help me see if there's any folklore about Maria and her fellows and, and what really happened there. Um, and so stay tuned for that. Okay. Um, okay, so the second part of the question, remind me, what was that? Why was his voyage uh, around the world a oh, secret voyage? Because um, the queen had signed uh, uh, a peace agreement <laughs> with Spain, saying we're not going to we're not going to raid you, or you know we're 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 going to work for peace, and it was a total lie. Oh. Um, and uh, she didn't want she wanted to to be able to say, oh, Drake was a pirate. I didn't instruct him. No, oh. Sorry, sorry, Spain, <laughs> sorry, King Philip. And so it was secret. And uh, I think the ambassador Mendoza knew that it wasn't, but they had to keep that pretense up. So. Uh -huh. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Well, uh, uh, excuse me. Oh, go ahead. No, but go ahead. I was going to close. Please, please go ahead, please, please. Okay. I just have a quick question, and that is, uh, was Drake's ship one of the first uh, uh, English ships to uh, roam the Pacific coast? <laughs> um, 
he had a, a buddy named John Oxenham, Oxenham who uh, went with him to Panama a few years before. And they climbed a tree and they saw the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic and, and uh, Drake and Oxenham looked at the Pacific and said, boy, I wanna be the first Englishman to sail the Great South Sea, the Pacific. And um, Oxenham went a, a, a year or so later, crossed Panama Isthmus with a, with a ship that was disassembled, assembled it near the Pearl Islands. So technically, John Oxenham was the first one to sail, uh, the first Englishman to sail in that sea. Um, uh, but he was captured uh, by the Spanish. In fact, when Drake came up to Lima, he was he wanted to free Oxenham, and he tried. He went into the port and and he cut all the ships loose, and he was going to use them as ransom to get Oxenham and his buddies out of jail. Oh man, it would have been interesting if yeah, if he had accomplished that. Mm -hmm. So he was. So Drake was the second one, <laughs> second Englishman to uh, take an English expedition there. Uh, well, this Great. is Tom speaking. Before we close, if there, are there any more questions? I just want to make a quick comment. No? Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, I first was introduced to this book by visiting my local, our local bookstore, Saucer Books by the Bay. And uh, that's where I purchased uh, my copy and others have pur purchased their copies. Um, Ms. Darby has kindly um, autographed a number of bookmarks that are available there to be picked up if you purchase Go Thunder Go North. The book is available commercially other, uh, and other sources, but we made a, a liaison, worked on a liaison with her and saw Suda by the books. And I think Jeff Battis was uh, signed in earlier today. So if you so desire, you can buy a book locally in Sausalito. And at that, I'll turn it over to um, Russell I'll, to close the evening. Thank you, I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Melissa. It's been delightful. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Likewise for all of everybody who attended. Thank you. Thank Good you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.